Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Jessica Winnegar and I am the Interim Director of the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities. We are delighted to welcome distinguished journalist Jane Mayer to Northwestern tonight for a conversation with our own Peter Slevin about the politics of truth in media today. This event is our winter keynote in the Kaplan Institute's Truth Dialogues. This is a year-long campus-wide conversation about knowledge crises and politics from humanistic perspectives. And the Truth Dialogues would not be complete, of course, without a thorough discussion of truth and the media, especially in these times. Some key questions ground this event tonight. What is the role of evidence and truth-telling in the midst of fake news, Twitter, and bots? What are the difficulties of verifying fact and speaking truth in the Trump era? What are the challenges of being a journalist when the media is being attacked? Our guests today will discuss these issues and more. Jane Mayer is an investigative journalist who has been a staff writer for The New Yorker for more than 20 years. She has written widely on a range of topics, including money in politics, the Obama administration's prosecution of whistleblowers, and expansion of the Predator drone program, and Trump's financial backer, Robert Mercer. Before her career at The New Yorker, she was at The Wall Street Journal and was that outlet's first woman to be named White House correspondent and subsequently senior writer and front page editor. For the journal, she reported on the bombing of the American barracks in Beirut, the Persian Gulf War, and the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the last days of communism in the former Soviet Union. She was nominated twice by the journal for the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. She's also co-authored two books, Strange Justice, The Selling of Clarence Thomas, and Landslide, The Unmaking of the President, 1984 to 1988, an account of Ronald Reagan's second term in the White House. Strange Justice was a finalist for the 1994 National Book Award for Nonfiction, and both of these books were finalists for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Mayer is also the author of The Dark Side, the inside story of how the war on terror turned into a war on American ideals. This book focuses on the use of enhanced interrogation techniques, otherwise known as torture, on detainees and the subsequent deaths of detainees. The Dark Side was a finalist for the National Book Awards and was one of the New York Times 10 most notable books of the year. Mayer's most recent book, which I'm sure many of you have read, Dark Money, became an instant bestseller when it was published in 2016. The New York Times named it one of the 10 best books of the year. Dark Money is, as its subtitle says, about the, quote, hidden history of the billionaires behind the rise of the radical right. In this incredible book, Mayer traces the billions of dollars spent by an oligarchic network of elite businessmen, including the Koch brothers, to change the core of the American political system. She shows their unprecedented influence on politicians, elections, policy making, the media, the courts, and even universities. This book brought her under attack by the Koch brothers and a former New York police chief who tried to smear her reputation. It was not smeared, and there's actually a new edition out, which I encourage you to read if you haven't, especially because it has a powerful new pre preface on the election of Donald Trump to the presidency. Dark Money won the 2017 Helen Bernstein Award and was a finalist for the Penn Jean Stein Prize, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize. We are honored to have Jane Mayer with us today. <laughs> Our other speaker is Medill Professor Peter Slevin, another renowned journalist. Peter was previously the European Bureau Chief for the Miami Herald, where he chronicled also the collapse of communism, you were both in Europe at the same time, before moving to the Washington Post. At the Post, he worked over a dozen years as, the diplomatic cor as a diplomatic correspondent and also as Chicago Bureau Chief. He covered the Bush-Gore recount in Florida and the Clinton presidential pardon scandal. As a diplomatic correspondent after the 9-11 attacks, he wrote extensively and, um, about the US foreign policy and the Iraq war and beautifully about soldiers. Slavin is also the author of the acclaimed 2015 book called Michelle Obama, A Life. In this book, Peter follows Michelle to the White House from her working class childhood on the South Side and he illuminates her trials at Princeton University and Harvard Law School during the racially charged 1980s and the dilemmas she faced in Chicago while building a high power career and raising a family and, and helping um, a community organizer become president of the United States. Michelle Obama, a life, was a finalist for the 2015 Penn Jacqueline Bograd Weld Award for Biography and was one of Booklist's top 10 biographies of 2015. So thank you, Peter, for being here this evening.
So before we be begin our conversation, I would like to first thank our co-sponsors, the Medill School of Journalism, Media, and Integrated Marketing Communication. And I also want to note that this event is part of the One Book, One Northwestern series. So please stay after the conversation. There will be plenty of time to ask questions, and please join us for a reception afterwards in the lobby. And now please join me in welcoming Jane Mayer and Peter Slevin. Jessica, for that, and welcome, Jane. Thank you for doing this. I have to start with a, a story from this very morning. I called my mom to check in, who lives in Washington, D.C., and she's uh, my elderly mom, my very, very elderly mom. She's almost 100. And I told her what I was doing today, and I said, well, I'm actually going to be spending some time with Jane Mayer. And she said, I rely on Jane Mayer. <laughs> and I thought, well, that is about perfect, because we all do to understand what really happened with Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill, um, how extraordinary rendition happened, and a few people who fought back, and of course, dark money and the Koch brothers, and how all that money contributed to the election of one Donald Trump, and even possibly to the creation of some alternative facts. So <laughs> want to get to as much of that as we can, and then we'll have questions. Um, but we really pretty much have to start with Donald Trump. He's 71 years old. He's uh, been our president for a year, and yet what do we make of him? What a question. <laughs> what well, do we, um, <laughs> um, particularly well, as he all, relates to the press, right? Thank you very much um, for having me here. Um, you know, I think like any speaker can come here in the, the warm weather, but um, <laughs> you've got to have a hearty one that's going to come for January in the Chicago area. And, um, and thank your mom. Um, I, I can tell from my, the letters I get in beautiful penmanship that my, my audience is tending towards the New Deal era. Um, um, yeah. So. Yeah. Her very first. So, and I love them dearly, actually. Her first vote so. for president, I think, was for FDR. Uh, you tell her to hold on. That's, I will. <laughs> um, I will. So, um, so tr you know, Trump, I, I, you know, I, he is, of course, baffling and um, exhausting for, and fascinating for all of us who are, who are covering him. I mean, it's, um, it's been just incredibly interesting. It's the, you know, the, the Dickens problem, the, the best of times and the worst of times for reporters. And, um, but, um, you know, I mean, I've, in my own experience, I'll tell you, I've had one really first-hand experience with him, which defies sort of what you would expect, probably. And it was when he, he hadn't been elected yet. It was the summer before the election. And, um, and the truth was that Hillary Clinton was really hard to get on the phone. Um, she had a Praetorian guard of people that kept you from ever being able to interview her. But I put in a request to talk to Trump, and two weeks later, the phone rang. I was home, and there was this sort of purry voice saying, you know, this is Donald Trump, and you know, you work for the New Yorker, you know, great publication. And, and, and I think, really? And, um, and um, I was doing a story about, about, the, about uh, Trump's ghostwriter of, of The Art of the Deal, his big best-selling book that kind of made him a national figure. And, and I said, I'm writing about Tony Schwartz, your, your co-author. And he said, love Tony Schwartz. And then I said, well, I don't think he's going to be voting for you. And, um, and his whole tone changed. And he said, is that right? And then he said, he probably thinks that's good for him. But he's going to find out this is not good for him. And he got this very sort of threatening tone. And he said, that is so disloyal. Um, and so you could forget the loyalty thing. And, and then he stayed on the phone. I couldn't get him off. That was the strange thing. <laughs> he, he was, it was about the point where he was picking vice presidents, and he wanted to talk about all the options, and who says what about whom, and all that kind of thing. And anyway, then I did finally get off. And about two minutes later, the phone rang. And it was Tony Schwartz. And he said, did you tell Donald Trump <laughs> that I'm not voting for him? And he hadn't heard from Trump in about 25 years. And Trump had still had his phone number, tracked him down, and gotten him in his car phone. And, um, and I said, well, yeah, I mean, it's true, right? And he said that, that Trump had screamed at him. And then he'd also said, by the way, he'd learned about this from some reporter at the New Yorker. And he said, it was a loser publication that nobody reads. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> then I thought, okay, well, I've got the guy's number anyway. But, but the thing was, you could get to him 
and he has this love-hate thing with the press. Yeah. He clearly wants, he, he's, he's hungry for the attention, and he was, what I discovered in writing that piece was, it just took off. It was five million readers within seconds, and were clicking on it when it ran. And so there, there was this kind of terrible devil's deal where the press looking for, you know, our business is going down the drain, and Trump was great box office, and, and he was using us, um, and many people he was sort of talking to unfiltered, uh, particularly the, you know, the cable news shows, to ju just, to, just to manipulate them and, and, and get across. So he has, he has some, you know, uh, it's not just that he thinks we're the enemies of the American people and that we're fake news. He wants to be, in print and on the air all the time, and he's tweeting all the time. I mean, he's really needy, and there's an aspect of that 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 um, is is really strange, and I think underappreciated. But um, but beyond that, I mean, I, I've you know I've been covering presidents since Reagan, and um, he did remind me a little bit of Reagan in some ways in his um, ignorance. <laughs> um, of uh, of statecraft and history and and um, and and much else, but also in his ability to connect in a kind of with sort of common um, people who you know in a way that seemed unpretentious that people really liked, and it made me worried when I was watching him as he was running that he that he had this kind of rare connection. And Tony Schwartz um, so kind of came out of the woodwork. And Tony Schwartz, who may have invented the phrase truthful hyperbole, or at least he attributed it to Trump. And that passage in, in, uh, in The Art of the Deal is all about who Donald Trump is, that people want to be told a great story, and they want to know that things are going to be amazing. And it's just a little truthful hyperbole. What's wrong with that? Tell them what they want to hear, right. is what he said to Tony Schwartz, his ghostwriter. And truthful hyperbole. Schwartz has been beating himself up for, you know, ever since Trump ran about this because he said, what is truthful hyperbole? It's a lie. What are alternative facts? They're lies. Um, that's, and, 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 but he was an enabler. And, and Trump, I mean, it's, a, it's he, you know, above everything else, I think he has a, 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 a really nasty view of human nature that believes at some point that people want to hear lies and they can be manipulated with them. And you give them what they want and you can get what you want. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, you kind of lo the lowest possible estimation of, of, of human nature. And um, the year hasn't seemed to change him. If you follow the Glenn Kessler, the Washington Post fact checker, compiling the numbers of misrepresentations in the course of just the first 365 days, and I think he came up with 2,041. An average of 5.9 a day, he happily pointed out. That's a lot of Pinocchios, which is the scale that they use. Doesn't seem to stop Trump at all. Does he know or care? Is it irrelevant to him? Does he believe these things, do you suppose? Well, I really, I mean, I, I may be old fashioned, and I'm sure I am, but I do think the truth matters and it does catch up with you. And I don't think, I mean, when you say it hasn't really hurt him, um, I think it, you know, his, his popularity is as low as any modern president's. And when I travel the country doing stories, I hear even from his supporters that they're very discomfited by his tweeting and his whole manner. Um, it, it, it's, it's not really that, it's, that he's impervious. He has, he has a lot of Teflon, but it's not complete. Um, and so I, 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 think, I think, you know, one place that it may very well catch up with him is uh, with the, the uh, special counsel who is all about getting the truth. And um, at a certain point, when you're under oath, it's very hard to have so-called truthful hyperbole. You get busted. So. And what do you suppose is going to be his, uh, his, his take going forward? He just kind of continues in the same style? Does he have it in him? I don't think he has the ability to, to change. And, and I get this from also from people who are around him all the time. Um, he, he's, um, you know, he, he 71's not young, and he's gotten away being like this for a very long time, and it works for him. I don't think he thinks he needs to change in, in any particular way. And so, um, he, you know, the one thing that, that uh, 
that he did do was bring in a new um, chief of staff, Kelly, who sort of imposed a little bit of order in there. Um, but, but that really changed the, the, the uh, structure of the White House, but it hasn't changed Trump himself, as we can see you know, every day. There's so. this intriguing dichotomy that you, you mentioned, that he actually does seem to crave attention, and we know this, but he also craves talking with reporters. He talks to them all the time. He pops up pops into on Air Force One, and he has these long conversations. There, it, he, he is much more accessible, for instance, than Obama was also. I mean, I was you know in and around the Obama White House as a reporter also, and it was very hard to get in and see him. And it was you, when you did, you had to just go for a few minutes and have a specific agenda, but um, or and they usually had they had a few background sessions that were off the record with a bunch of us. But but basically, um, with Trump, what keeps happening is he will just have these sort of uh, off the cuff gatherings of reporters, or he'll just invite a couple ones in. I mean, I'm friends with Maggie Haberman and Glenn Thrush, and they're the reporters for the Times, and, and, and they, they've just had, they get invited in, Trump's sitting there at his desk, he's kind of shooting the breeze, he mostly, he, he loves to hand out laminated pictures of the electoral map, still, <laughs> that show which parts he won, and um, and 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 they've been. I mean, and we've seen this with Michael Wolf too. The reporters are wandering the White House when they can, and they can um, at some points. I mean, and 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 Maggie Haberman and Glenn Thrush were in early on, and and um, nobody really paid any attention to them. They were looking. They were there as as sort of lights and quarters were turned out, turned off, and they were kind of you know trying to feel their way out of the yeah. White House because nobody seemed to remember they were there anymore. Same. So it's it's very strange. It's the it's 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 not like any presidency from any standpoint, including just physically covering it. One of my so. favorite moments um, in Maggie Haberman's coverage. They were they were flying. Um, they were on Air Force One, flying somewhere to Europe, I guess it was. He comes back, he's talking at great length. And the next day, he went up to Maggie Haberman and said, hey, why, why didn't you quote me in your story? We talked about that yesterday. And she said, well, you said it was off the record. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it at all. You can quote me, whatever you want, which is very distinctively different from, <laughs> distinctly well, different. I mean, from, have we ever had a president who, who had an alter ego and a different name? He called himself some, John Barron, and he used to call the tabloids pretending to be a press secretary and saying how great he was and where he was not headed. just how great he was, but also he was responsible, I think, for what the right. was considered the most libel-proof headline of all time in the New York Post, right. which was Marla Maple saying "best sex I ever had" about Donald Trump. So right. um, <laughs> that was <laughs> so. The flip side of the dichotomy, I think, we should talk about too. He can be incredibly mean publicly toward the media generally, individuals specifically. Um, he does call the American media, he calls them you know, enemies of the American people. Um, when Megan Toohey, who happened to grow up in Evanston and go to ETHS, called him to say um, he was, she was reporting this story about a couple of women um, whom he had allegedly sexually harassed, he called her a disgusting human being. Um, and he goes on and on and on when he is out um, on the stump using words that you would sort of more typically assigned to traitors. He's, you know, he sort of, he says there's sick people and I really think they don't like our country. Does that have, um, first I'm curious what, you, what effect that has on reporters, if any, and secondly, does it undermine notions of, and the credibility of the media? Does it have well, a sure, I mean, I mean, to be serious, it's of course a really, a, a, a dangerous dynamic to have a, I mean, pre, the, he put it to start at the beginning. He's far from the first president who's disliked the press, um, or the first politician who has. And I mean, it's more typical that they dislike us than like us. But he is the first to suggest that we have no legitimate role to play whatsoever in a democracy, and at least that I've dealt with. And so, um, you know, it's a, of course it's a it's a it's a really dangerous dynamic. It seems to be undercutting um, support for for the press um, across the country. I mean, we're, we're um, you know, probably less popular than undertakers at this point. But, um, you know, I, I, it's, I, I think that um, 
if you, don't, you look around the world and you see that we are not alone in having to um, have leaders that are attacking the legitimacy of the press. And, and if you look around the world, you can see how dangerous it can become. We don't have those problems here now, but if you look at Russia, reporters are killed. If you look at much of the world, reporters are killed. For, um, it's, you know, it's, it's not just that he's attacking the truth, he's attacking anyone who will tell it. And I guess if you step back, I think what to me is, is one of the most disturbing dynamics of this administration is that um, the, the way that um, um, Paul Krugman put it at one point was that, it, is that Trump um, and the, administ the administration in many ways are attacking not just the idea of science and of the press, but of the whole sort of scientific fact-based method of understanding the world. And so they are trying to replace it with a kind of their own um, view of what of you know self-interest, what suits them, and and the fact their alternative facts are are that he had the biggest inaugural crowd that ever existed, and um, or at least bigger than Obama's. You could count the number of people and see it wasn't true, but um, he's you know, and those of us who care about the truth as are at least trying to get a version of it, the closest we can get to it, would count the people. But that doesn't matter anymore when you've gotten post um, sort of scientific method. And I think that's where it, where it gets really dangerous. And I think you can see him attacking any kind of independent um, authority, and which gets us into not just the press and not just science and climate science and all of that and, and the ag agencies that have scientists in them, but he's also uh, attacking the independent judiciary. And I think that's why most of us um, are really on edge about what's happening with his attacks on the FBI and on the top levels of the Justice Department because these are places that are supposed to be nonpartisan, apolitical, and, um, and respond to, they're supposed to be doing a search for evidence, another form of fact-based truth. And instead, what you're seeing is um, an attempt to intimidate and bully them into serving his interests. And, and that's really, that it violates as much as anything a norm of how, how governments functioned, at least in the modern period, and, 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 and among the things that make our government make us proud of it, make it a working democracy, is these sort of independent centers of power. Um, so with the checks and balances, that's what we're, you know, and so anyway, but I think the thing that ties it all together is a lack of respect for kind of truth. This is, this is possibly an unanswerable question, but where does this lead? Do you think that the, uh, the center holds? Do you think that these institutions, you mentioned the threat to the FBI and to the judiciary and to the media, I'm pretty proud of, I, I think we're holding pretty well, considering how powerful the assault is. I'm, I'm thinking, the, the, I think that if you start with the press, I think when I said it was the best of times and the worst of times, I think we've seen some of the best press coverage um, in a really long time. Um, and the New York Times has been terrific, and it's, it's every day in a newspaper war with the Washington Post that's like one of those old, Fashion front page fights, um, and um, and I think uh, you know NPR is doing a great job. A lot of people are doing amazing work in this country at this point. Um, there and 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 I think we have a lot to be. You know, I'm I'm uh, it's it, I just feel really good about the the power of the press to to just keep its head down and keep reporting. I think um, we'll see what happens with Mueller. I wouldn't put it past Trump to try to fire him, but I think it will be a crisis if he does. Um, and um, I don't know how it will come out, but I, I, I feel we have a pretty strong civil society in this country now. I think people learned a lot from the McCarthy years, and we have um, st strong institutions like uh, legal institutions and NGOs and I see where I sit, I get an awful lot of um, mail and email from um, groups that are, are getting mobilized and are upset. I think they're getting galvanized all around the country. So 
I think this is, I mean, I think it's a scary moment. I don't want to, um, you know, be Pollyannish about it, but I, I think it's, it's an incredible challenge. But I feel so far this country, you know, we're, we're not, we're not Russia, <laughs> and um, and I'm really glad of that. But I, you know, we, I feel it, better already. This so, is good. Okay. Yeah, this, is, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Well, one of the wonderful things about your work as, as an investigative reporter is that you don't just tell us what has happened, but you show why. And I think there's a, there's a lovely line through so much of your reporting that connects so very many dots. And one could read Dark Money and the work you did on, on big money from Art Pope to the Cokes to the Mercers um, as, in some ways, um, laying the groundwork for the government that we have now and oh, yeah. attitudes that we have now. Uh, and I, I, in Dark Money, you start with a memo, or you, you, you go into some detail um, about a memo that future Justice Powell wrote about a tax on kind of the economic way of life. This was back when he was representing the tobacco companies before he was on the court, and how um, that vision kind of tapped into, kind of connected with what the Koch brothers then spent hundreds of billions of dollars doing. And I think you said that it was a way, an effort to essentially change the politics and the way the country um, is run. Yeah, well, I... Can you talk a little bit about that? So I, I, I do actually, you know, a lot of people looked at Trump's um, election and and concluded from it that, um, the, that because he didn't have the traditional big Republican backers behind him, including the Koch brothers, that that it meant that they they were not really factors in what had happened, and that big money was not actually that important in that election. And and in in a way, what I, I see it differently. I think what happened was that it, you can look at Trump many ways as the unintended consequence of of these big money backers. And what they started, and they started about 40 years ago, 1971 was the Powell Memo. And if you look at that chunk of history, what you can see is that, that starting in 1971, at that point, if you scroll back and try to remember or, or learn about it if you're young, too young to remember, what was happening was there was, there was sort of raging anti-war sentiment about the Vietnam War, and there was a rising consumer uh, movement with Ralph Nader, and there was a uh, rising environmental movement. And these things were, and there were feminist movement too. Um, and these things were, were um, in many ways very upsetting to the sort of corporate captains in the country at the time. That particularly the, the Ralph Nader thing, which was going after the, the auto industry, and um, and the environmentalists were going after the big polluters, um, and and the, and so um, and the tobacco business, as you said, was also under under fire. So what Powell did was he was writing for the Chamber of Commerce, and he said to to he wrote a memo to the captains of industry at his time, and he said, "You guys better get organized." If you do not fight back, you're going. You know we're going to lose um, c capitalism in this country, and um, and and we're going. And he said. And the thing that I found most interesting about his memo was he said the enemy is not the kids in the street. It's not the yippies and hippies. The enemy is um, the liberal establishment, and you're going to have to replace those guys because they are. It's it's college professors, it's scientists, it's newspaper editors, it's um, uh, the judges. Um, it was the sort of the liberal establishment that had been, um, that, that he, he saw in power was the enemy of big business. And he said, You're, we're gonna have to really create our own establishment and, and build it up and fight back. And the, the, the big business guys, particularly the Cokes, um, began to pour money in to creating um, a whole alternative, um, a machine that would create a different establishment and, and, and would fight for corporate, corporate rights, basically. And so that was 40 years ago. And what I think they've done is the main focus of their attack was to say that government is iniquitous it's, and, and the New Deal was a mistake, the progressive movement was a mistake, 
and that corporate America really should have the power in the country. You need to dial back on regulations, get rid of uh, progressive taxation, and give um, business kind of the reins in this country. And um, they weren't, kids were not being taught that in the universities, so they decided to subsidize their own professors and professorships. Um, they created what um, Jeffrey Winter, a professor here, would call the wealth defense industry. That would, it was a, uh, they, they, they had lawyers and tax accountants and lobbyists who figured out ways to sort of create loopholes that would help their businesses, help them deregulate. Um, and then they, um, they tried running for office. The Kochs specifically tried to run on this kind of ideology, and they got nowhere. They, it was not popular. Um, it, was a, it was seen as a um, kind of a crazy fringe, so fringe that um, on the right that, that um, William F. Buckley at the time um, described them as anarcho-totalitarians. <laughs> and um, and that's what the that's what the Kochs and and the sort of libertarian movement were seen as on the right at that point, and to me what has been what the the, the challenge of understanding <clears throat> politics in these last forty years is how did a couple billionaire brothers, who were considered almost jokes, get from so far out that they were laughed at to the center of power in the Republican Party in this country. And part, uh, and part of it was by their spending, and part of it, I have to say, was by the, the sort of the attention they gave to pushing their, their ideology, their propaganda, their, their alternative facts. Right. And they created a machine um, in think tanks and grassroots movements and continued to push. And finally, what you got was a Republican Party that was so far to the right and so serving corporate interests by 2016 that all the other candidates but Trump were Koch candidates. And they were the ones, and they really were. The Kochs would have been happy with any of the other Republican nominees. And they were standing by and waiting to put $889 million that their treasury chest had collected from they and their allies behind whichever Republican nominee they got. But they got the one nominee that they didn't want, and that was Trump. And the public put him there because he was not running on this ticket that, that had gone, been sort of captured by the, the far, far right, which was running against Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, any kind of social safety net programs, um, to cut the taxes for the super rich. These, and, and instead, Trump came in and said, I'm going to protect your Social Security. Remember this? Yeah. I'm going to protect your Medicare and Medicaid. And, um, and he didn't mean it, I don't think. <laughs> but um, but, but there, was a, there was an opening, and he ran through it. He, he, he campaigned as a populist, a, a, right, a sort of a, a you know, and, 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 and it blew away the other nominees, who were really the Koch worldview. Um, so he got elected partly by being able to exploit a loophole they left open. And then he also was able to, I think, capitalize on the fact that for 40 years they had been pushing a message, they and the other you know, really wealthy donors, big donors on the right, were pushing a message that government's terrible, that Washington doesn't know what it's doing, that it can't do anything right. Well, after 40 years of hearing that, Many people felt, felt it was no problem to elect a businessman who knew nothing about the government and, in fact, you know, said it was all rigged and that he knew how to solve problems and government officials didn't. So, um, so I see him as their unintended consequence. And they see it, too, in many ways. The people who were in their movement said that they helped. Um, there, there's an interesting piece in Politico that ran before the election, right after the election, actually, and it was where they were. The, some of the people in the Coke network were talking about how we created a monster. Um, we made people so mad in, with the Tea Party movement that they became kind of uncontrollable, and we, you know, we we spun them up, and 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 then we lost control of them, and they all voted for Trump. Um, but. Anyway, the, the thing about the, 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 the thing about the Cokes that I think is worth saying and, and, and some of the other big donors is that they, they didn't get the candidate they wanted, but more and more they've gotten the government they want. 
They and got that's Mike, what really they got is. Mike Pence. They got Mike Pence, got who was Pence. their favorite candidate yeah. in 2012. They wanted Pence to run for president. He's been sort of one of their, almost their creation. Um, and um, and they've got so many people who've infiltrated from the, who've worked with the Koch network, who are sprinkled in in all over the government at this point. It's it, it makes me feel like you know one of those kind of paranoid. You know that the, the the what was the 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 a beautiful mind? You know the, the where they had the chart where there you have all the different connecting dots. It makes you look like a lunatic, mm -hmm. but the truth is it's really there. <laughs> so I, I I apologize if yeah. it sounds paranoid, but it really is fascinating to watch. And it's I'm not far from the only person seeing this. There's a terrific study that was done by two Harvard professors, um, Theta Scotchpole and and. Um, um, Alexander Herzl Fernandez that's about the Coke machine. And it says, you've really never seen anything like it in this country. country. It's a private political machine that has more employees than the Republican National Committee. And it has empowered and, 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 and enabled its own people to really kind of infiltrate um, every level of the government. And so they're, they're enacting policies that are great for Coke Industries. Their, Pruitt is their dream come true mm -hmm. at the EPA. Right. And all of those judges. And the ju well, Gorsuch especially, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And what's so intriguing about your work is that you were mapping this quite a while ago. And it is fascinating and it is scary. And their patience is also remarkable. I mean, the Powell memo says we've got to get to elite public opinion. And they said, well, we can do that. And over this long period of time, they did. But that also takes us up to another chapter that you've um, of the, the story that you've written so well, and that's the Mercers, <laughs> and where the Mercers have come from, and they are large. They are responsible for a pretty significant chunk of I, Trump world in and connecting with Breitbart and yeah. Bannon and Kellyanne Conway. I mean, part of it is I actually find the characters really interesting as a reporter. Characters. And a, a lot of investigative reporters are all about numbers and 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 following the money is a really, um, I, I mean, it, it is a puzzle that is fun to put the pieces together with. You know, it's it's hard, but when, they, when you begin to see the pattern, it's fascinating. But the characters are so improbable in this. I can't believe these, that when I get to know who the people are who have this much power in this country, I keep thinking if the public had any idea who these people were, they would be so shocked. I, I, you know, and Can you think of one particular <laughs> fact that Bob Mercer well, attributes to the Clintons, for example, that might be a little unusual? Which one were you thinking of? Well, that he, he thinks they are actually murderers. Oh, he they does, They have actually yeah. committed murder. No, he does. He literally thinks that Hillary Clinton and, and Bill Clinton are murderers. And, um, but he's also literally funding uh, a scientist who is, lives in Oregon on a ranch who, he, who claims that he's going to find the, the key to eternal life. And, and what Bob Mercer, this man who has this, so much power over our government at this point, is doing is, is helping this man collect tens of thousands of human urine samples in order to do this out on a sheep ranch in order to test for, you know, to be able to live forever. Is, it's, isn't you the one it, who also thinks that if we just spread all the nuclear waste very thinly around the He thinks nuclear world, fallout is good for your health. It's going to be health, good for your health. Which yeah. I think is a scary thought and for someone for with that much power. But that, because he's kind of normalizing in his own mind the kind of idea of, of nuclear war, really. Um, he um, is... Um, you know, he doesn't like speaking to people. He said he'd be perfectly happy if he could go through the rest of his life just talking to his cat. Um, I mean, and I'm a dog person, so I, <laughs> so I don't understand that. Um, but, um, but, you know, but the same was true with the Koch brothers. I mean, they, there were actually four brothers, and I couldn't, the family is amazing. Um, I mean, the four brothers, they, they were twins. Who are tw there's a set of twins, <laughs> but they divided into two teams, breaking up the twins. Um, and the two teams of two siblings against each other, they litigated against each other for 20 years, spending tens of millions of dollars, hiring private eyes to sleuth on each other, go through each other's garbage. And they each, they had all already inherited $300 million apiece from their father, but they were fighting over who got more. 
mm -hmm. um, and, and who was going to get control of this company. And, um, and, it, 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 and then meanwhile, I mean, for, you know, just for color, it was kind of amazing to me that their father had started and made the fortune partly by um, refining oil, building the refineries for Stalin in, in, in this, the first fa five year phase of the Soviet Union. And then after he finished working with Stalin, he went to Germany and worked with Hitler and built a refinery for him that was key in, in creating, refining the oil in, in World War II against America um, for the jet for the fuel, for the jet fuel for yeah. the Nazi jets. Um, so I, I, it, these the history of these people is so interesting, and and the Not characters the, are uh, the Nazi housekeeper. Oh, the, the Nazi, Nazi nanny. nanny. The father right. brought brought home a Nazi nanny um, to br to raise the Koch brothers. <laughs> that that you you just can't make these things up. Right. Um, and 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 she was. Um, um, uh, she kind of terrified the poor, the boys, and I had a, I had some sympathy for them because a German, you know, nursemaid like that was was she was cruel to the little boys. But she then left of her own volition. It's not like the Koch family told her to leave. She left after Charles Koch was um, five years old, I guess, because she wanted to go back to be with the Führer when he invaded France, um, and she wanted to celebrate. So. It was a really strange upbringing, and 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 it's yet yeah, they've had this tremendous influence on American politics. And it's not to say that they're Nazis, and they're not Nazis, but they they um, they they are extremists. And their father was one of the founders of the John Birch Society, and they come out of of a very distinctive, you know, far far right strain in American politics. And I think the the interesting thing is. How did we get to this point in this country where such extreme ideology has been imposed on what I think of as a generally a pretty commonsensical mainstream country? You know, how did we wind up with such strange leaders? And, and how did Congress end up serving their interests? And I think the answer, you have to say, has a lot to do with money. Money and and maybe how that money was applied, um, and how that and in terms the, of right. you know for the topic at hand and truth and facts and evidence in the media, where the Mercers, so this reclusive Bob, hugely wealthy hedge fund manager Bob Mercer, meets Andrew Breitbart, his virtual opposite, but who supplies the vision to that he powers with. Yeah, I mean, money. so and and actually. But the, what happened with the Mercers, Mercer runs a, a hedge fund, and um, he's a brilliant computer scientist. And, but he knows very little about sort of humanities and politics, really. He lives in a strange bubble and, uh, as I said, doesn't like talking to people. And so um, the person that really translated politics for him was Steve Bannon. And, and Bannon, who I've, I interviewed and have interviewed any number of times by now, very deliberately set out to create, a, a, to turn Bob Mercer into kind of, a, um, to build him up along the model of the Kochs, where what he realized was the Kochs had um, funded uh, an, an ideology machine, think tanks and um, publications and university programs, all of which are cre pushing their ideology out into the mainstream and normalizing it. And so what Bannon wanted to do was that's create that same kind of system for the Mercers. And so he helped them um, buy and build Breitbart News. And then in the think tank area, he helped them build something, uh, create something called the Government Accountability Institute, or which um, it was, it, it was to, it, to do its own opposition research. One of its biggest targets was Hillary Clinton during the last campaign. Um, dig down deep, come up with um, all the dirt they could find on her, and, and then write it in a kind of a digestible form, which became a best-selling book, and that was Clinton Cash. And, um, and Bannon was very, very clever about it. They took this book. Um, and, and, and they fed it exclusively early on to the New York Times. And the Times ran with some of the content in it and put it on the front page. So what 
what the Mercer fortune in, in the hands of Bannon managed to do was to take opposition research and, and turn it into a best-selling book and then give it the credibility stamp of the New York Times, which was um, you know, a home run for them. And, um, and it, it you know, had great, great impact. It, it, it pushed out a lot of the stories about you know, uranium one that you're still hearing about. And if you turn on Fox, you can still hear the, the, yeah. the main hits of Clinton Cash. Yeah, I think you've called it information warfare. And didn't Bannon tell you that the Trumps, you know, he, he argued that the, that the Mercers laid the groundwork for, for Trump? He did. He, he gives them a tremendous amount of credit for yeah. it. And he, he felt, you know, very good about it. Um, I mean, I, I, what you're seeing, though, is, is uh, people who have a lot of money and are very savvy about how to manipulate public opinion in the country and how to use social media also at this point to do it, which, which Bannon was very good at that, too. He'd been working at it a long time. I mean, that's what Breitbart does. It's, it's all about you know, get going viral with things. And then so. it's created an alternative reality, and an awful lot of people are prepared to believe it. And yeah, I mean, and unlike, I mean, the, you know, the, obviously the, 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 the thing about um, uh, Hillary, the Clintons murdering people was so far out that not a lot of people are going to believe it. But, but what was smart about Clinton Cash and I think about a lot of the stuff that Bannon was involved in, is there's often a shred of truth in it. There's, or there is some decent research in it. It's just that there's no um, fairness to it. So there's no context. Um, it, it's not like, I mean, my tradition is coming out of being a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. And what you learn at a place like that is you call up both sides. And you may believe one more than the other, but you try to give each side an airing of what they're what they're trying to say, so that um, and 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 that tradition was completely lost in in this new new alt right media world. Um, but there's enough there so that you can't just like always just dismiss it out of hand. And that is that's that's much more clever than. Than the old so what's, right. What's the response to that then in the, the the quality media that is still trying to do the right thing? How do you fight back against that, or do you? It's it's hard because one of the things I was seeing one of my heroes is is Robert Caro um, uh, as a, a writer, and I was the answers to write nine hundred page books. Yes, and well, <laughs> they and but but and somebody was asking him in a in a Q and A thing, well, how do you get the truth? Um, and what he said is. It takes time. And that he, he, in his own work, had gone back to people time and time and time again. And it was only on the 10th visit to Hill Country, Texas, over a beer that someone really told him the story. And the truth is that, you know, I'm, I'm very slow, not, um, and I'm not, not as good as Caro. But even what I do, it takes a lot of time. And the whole emphasis right now is on moving so fast that um, you know, you, 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 I, I think that um, I'm just hoping that there's an appetite still of thoughtful pe enough thoughtful people out there who really want to take the time to read a longer version and by people who've taken the time, like people at The New Yorker. And I think there are. I, you know, I, I really. I really do, but um, I'm worried about the social media thing right now. That I think is we haven't figured out, and I, I have to say I blame Facebook and and uh, Google for not yeah. weeding out real lies. Mm -hmm. um, well, on the issue of what is really good journalism, I have to quote the Pope on this one. I don't know if you all saw, but the Pope actually issued a statement last week on the media and on fake news, which he defined in a very very sophisticated way, and he talked about journalism, and he talked about how journalism is not a job, it is in fact a mission. Um, he of course quoted John 8.32, the truth will set you free, and he said um, that it's very important um, amid feeding frenzies and the mad rush for a scoop, journalists must remember that the heart of information is not the speed with which it is reported or its audience impact, but people and so on and so forth, and how it, the essential thing is journalism must be truthful and opposed to falsehoods, rhetorical slogans, and sensational headlines. 
a journalism created by people for people, one is that at the service to all, less concentrated on breaking news than on exploring the underlying, underlying causes of conflict. The Pope has spoken. So well, there you go. Well, I also, that, that's <laughs> lovely. I also lo liked what he said about um, when fake news really began, and he mentioned <laughs> that it started with that serpent in did in, Adam, in, in Genesis. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> this is an old problem. He knows it. It is an old problem, <laughs> and we are all, you know, for some reason, susceptible <laughs> to being seduced by it, too. It's, it's funny so. that he knows his biblical references, doesn't he? <laughs> um, now, at one point, the Cokes came after you. I can't, I can't avoid asking about how we can sort of joke about these characters and find them very interesting, but were there not, was there not a moment when... Um, you were the enemy. I was, yeah. That way it was, um, it was, uh, you know, maybe almost flattering that they they <laughs> took the time. It's like being on Nixon's I, enemies list. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, so that was when I, I did the for a, a ten thousand word piece in the uh, New Yorker about uh, the Cokes, and it was really the first piece that anybody had done at length about them, their influence on politics, and it was called Covert Operations because they were at that point really secretive and they were they were refusing to talk to me and they were saying they were having they were doing nothing politically with the tea party and it turned out they were um, that just wasn't true anyway they were very it's I think safe to say unhappy with the story um, and um, and so what happened was I, it took me a long time to figure this out but what happened was, the New Yorker was about to nominate the story for a prize, and they wanted to stop that from happening. So they decided to wreck my reputation. And they had been working with the former commissioner of police in New York City, who had become a, had a private eye firm. And he had spent months with um, a daughter who'd been in the FBI, and a son who was a lawyer, and some other sleuths, apparently going through my life looking for dirt. Um, finally, I got, um, Somebody told me the whole story later, but um, I didn't learn about it till they popped up um, with, uh, called my boss at the New Yorker, um, David Remnick, and said, um, we're about to go with, um, two publications said they were about to go with exposés about me being a plagiarist. And somehow two, two publications had the story on the same day. I had overnight to try to um, respond to this. And... Um, it was really kind of, I have to admit, it was nerve wracking. Um, and I thought, you know, for the rest of my life, I, when you looked for my name, it was going to say plagiarist. And um, so I got um, them, the, these publications, to tell me what the examples of my crimes were. And there were four sentences in 10 years worth of work that had words that were similar to other sentences that people had had. And so I, I took overnight and I called up the writers of the original texts and said, do you think I plagiarized from you? If you do, I'm really sorry. But if not, can you help me out here? Yeah. And, and they, each one of them, my colleagues were fantastic. They all sent statements saying, this is not plagiarism. She does her own work. We have respect for her. And so by staying up all night, I had these four statements. And I contacted the two news organizations in the morning and I said, Here's what the people who I'm supposed to plagiarize say from say, and um, um, they're taking my side, and what they're, you're saying is untrue, and it's a textbook case of libel, and I'm going out to walk the dog. And, <laughs> and when I came back, I had emails from both publications, wow. the New York Post and um, mm -hmm. um, and the other one, um, and the, which was Tucker Carlson at that point, and um, and they both said we're not going with the story. So I thought, okay, Good guys um, win. yeah, Yay. but um, <laughs> <laughs> it was ugly. <laughs> so. Only slightly related, but you know, one of the things that strikes me, a lot of us I'm sure have seen The Post, the new movie about the Pentagon Papers, and possibly some of us have even gone back and, and watched All the President's Men just to see how that was. Um, one of the things that's very striking about this um, newspaper war that you're talking about that's been, a, in, I agree, such a positive thing, um, is the, supportive, the supportiveness of reporters to one another. You have The Post um, tweeting out, 
praise for the Times and vice versa on these scoops. And you get this sense that reporters in some ways, even though they're fiercely competitive, also have each other's back in a way. Does that, is that true, do you think? I mean, we admire each other's great work. You, wanna, you, you wish wanna it was yours. Them. You want to kill them, yeah, but, right. but... That goes without saying. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a kind of profession you go into for... You don't do it for the money. Um, you, you, you do feel it's... Keep a, that in mind. <laughs> you do it for... Um, a, a love of the the story, the history, the the public mm -hmm. events, the feeling like you're serving to some extent, and um, you know there's often a um, a kind of a camaraderie that goes with it after hours. Still, I, I felt it most in a way when I was writing about the um, uh, the torture program of the of the Bush administration of the on the in the war on terror. Because that was, it was really a, a kind of a wonderful feeling, really, um, it, believe it or not, in the midst of covering torture. What, what happened was that was a really hard puzzle to put together. You had the Bush administration saying, we, we don't torture people. What happened in Abu Ghraib was just a few rotten apples at the bottom of a barrel. Um, and um, there's no pattern here. And what a, a handful of reporters working around the world really were looking at was, among other things, these extraordinary renditions where detainees were being kidnapped and thrown by, by, by masked US um, special ops people into planes and taken off the face of the earth into dungeons someplace and, and interrogated. And what, ha what sprung up was a kind of, um, uh, a network of reporters who started watching the tail numbers of the planes, and huh. um, and you would they would they would email you saying it's landed in Ireland, and uh, somebody's missing in Madrid, and that it took off there, and it's you know and you would it 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 became kind of like a you know like in a relay race when you pass the baton you couldn't. Do the whole story on your own, but you could you could pass off what you'd heard to somebody else, and then they would run with it, and they would see somebody disappear somewhere else. And it was fascinating. It was the first time I've seen the internet in a kind of a global news gathering thing. We've seen since then, you know, things like the Panama Papers um, and um, the Paradise Papers come out where you're really able to utilize kind of a, a global network of information gatherers and, and reporters around the world who are sort of focusing together on something. And, um, and, and it, 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 was, it was a really great sense of community. I, I, I'd never really, I mean, I've, I've loved my colleagues, but I'd never really seen oh. it happen like that before. Oh, this is really great. So. Well, why don't we go to questions, because I'm sure there are many. And we have microphones that will be passed around the room, so just raise your hand if you have a question, and just a reminder to ask a question and to keep it brief. Thank you, so um, Where's, you guys, who has the mics? You two? Okay. Do you want to pick How about this people? one right here? Yeah, okay. Oh, oh, she's right here. Okay. Of course. We'll take you and then the, the person next to you. Um, so since we're, you know, also talking about truth and all that, I was wondering um, how much stock you put into Michael Wolff's book. I've just been reading it um, over the past few days. Um, obviously, it's like a fascinating book. Um, and also kind of um, the interviews he does with Steve Bannon in that book, where he talks about Bannon's intention to run in 2020 with uh, Robert Mercer's backing. And if you think that's still possible now. Uh, if, so, yeah. um, so being truthful, I haven't read the book yet. Um, I've been really immersed in another project, and I've been keep putting it off because I really am dying to read it. But I have to make myself kind of, you know, tread, <laughs> trudge through the spinach that I'm in first, um, and and then I can get to the dessert. Um, uh, what I've read of it um, is. Um, uh, a picture of Trump that's very much Bannon talking, um, and I recognize Bannon's voice in it, having interviewed him a bunch of times. And so it's 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 um, it has some small mistakes that that every book has probably you know small factual errors that probably get fixed in in later editions, um, and I think it's it's skewed to one one point of view pretty much that's 
fits Bannon's point of view. I've heard Bannon say he wanted to run for president himself in 2020. Um, and I, I don't think he's going to be getting the backing of the Mercers anymore. Um, and so they, they, they have split with him and taken the side of the Trumps There's so, so far. So they're, they're going with the power, which is what I think interested in them in the first place, you know. So, um, so anyway, I'm, I, 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 I look forward to reading it. Did you enjoy it? So far, I haven't uh -huh. finished it yet. I, I haven't finished it, but so far it's been really fascinating. <laughs> I mean, I do think, as someone who's covered the White House since Reagan's era, that that the story um, is, you know, is very much Trump's character and his his um, his his personality, as much as his ideology, is just what's so f phenomenal. I mean, he's so so unfit for this job that he's in that it's shocking and 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 you just know as a reporter that all the people around him are seeing it every minute of the day and and that they're going to rat him out at some point and that that's why you have all the leaks in the white house you had a lot of leaks in the in the reagan white house too from people who were right around the president but um i mean and he can keep trying to to plug the leaks but so long as he's he's shocking the people around him the the information just it just gets out, and so, I mean, I think Wolf was smart to hone right on in on that. Next question. Uh, oh, may I? Yes, you are the next question. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> One of the things you sort of don't mention in your analysis of the rise of the Koch brothers is sort of the ability of the alt-right to foment um, racial animus, xenophobia, and the um, puritanical, evangelical right. Um, mm -hmm. To what extent does that play into the quest for money and power? Do those elements play into the quest for money and power? Well, there, there's a long history of racism in the, in the, the strain of far-right politics that the Kochs come out of. I mean, the John Birch Society that their father helped found was, was in part founded in, in opposition to um, Brown versus the Board of Education. Their, their family grew up in Kansas and um, where the Brown case came out of. And um, they were, they, the, the Birch Society was always putting up billboards saying, you know, impeach Earl Warren. And um, they, Charles Koch, the, 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 the man who really is the sort of protean figure in, in, in that movement now, um, used to fund a, a, an all white school called the Freedom School mm -hmm. that was. Um, that, that didn't allow black students because he said it might offend the segregationists that were among the student body. And, and so there's, there's some kind of ugly past there. Um, he, he's changed, that was a long time ago. He says he's changed a lot. Um, I felt that, there, that in the opposition to Obama, there was a really um, major unspoken uh, racial strain to it, and that's part of the reason that their movement took off the way that it did. Um, they were, you know, th th there were sort of statements from David Koch saying that that Obama really was African, not American, and that he had sort of the radical ideology of his African father that was un-American. So, I mean, they sort of believed that whole, this is, the, you know, he's not really an American kind of thing, um, or at least David did. He, he made statements to that effect. And then what happened in the you know the, the in the Tea Party I think was they they were able to sort of spin up the anger, uh, the legitimate anger to some extent that a lot of white poor white and lower middle class whites felt after the the, the economic meltdown in two thousand eight that they 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 were washed up and had no prospects of you know sort of no path forward, and 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 kind of turn it into an anger against the government and against programs that they were portrayed as giving things to other people. Um, and particularly, that's how they really, if you look at what they were doing in their opposition to health care, a lot of it was that they're taking your money and giving health care to poor people who are undeserving, AKA black people, a lot of it. So, I mean, I think there was a real racial element in it and, it was, and, and that they were willing to, to kind of um, exploit it in the Tea Party. And, and the problem with libertarianism is it's never been popular with the masses. It's abstruse and it's, it's, it, 
it's just an, it's an ideology that doesn't win votes on its own. And in order for it to win, they need to have the popular support of people who don't really care about, about libertarianism. So they get them through these other things, <coughs> issues. If I'm, as a small subset of that, if I'm not mistaken, you've also talked about um, the effect of Andrew Breitbart dying at age 43, four days before the Mercer's big relaunch of his site, and Bannon taking over. And Bannon having this sort of uh, more dramatic economic nationalism, as well as these, you know, the clearly racist um, well, sure. aspects of of the site that weren't as clear when Breitbart was there. Is that is that right? Yeah, I mean, and so the the, the you know the 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 white nationalism that Breitbart espouses is. I mean, it, they would claim it's not necessarily racist, but you know they're targeting immigrants, people of color, um, and uh, it, it's, you know, and we've seen the demonstrations in places like Charlottesville that are, that have sort of the outgrowth of this thing. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I think it's a very much of a, of a you know, the, the Kochs would say they don't support racism and that sort of, they've, they've been working for criminal justice reform and they've been giving money to historically back black colleges, and they're doing a number of things that that um, have won over support in in pro, sort of progressive circles. But meanwhile, they are <laughs> funding a government that is, um, you know, um, exploiting a lot of racial hostility and a lot of. Um, immigrant, anti-immigrant hostility. And you make the point in the book, in Dark Money, that the support of criminal justice reform and historically black colleges is actually part of a strategy to well, yeah, kind of win what, the, the middle. <laughs> what happened was after 2012, the Kochs put a ton of money into 2012 with their donor group and lost. Mm -hmm. um, they tried to get Romney, help get Romney elected. And so they went back to the drawing board to figure out what went wrong. And they did all of these marketing studies and focus groups, and they came to the, the conclusion that people thought they were greedy. Um, and so they needed to change their image. And so, um, and, and, and w luckily, some of the, the, the conversations that took place in these focus groups were taped, and the tapes have come out. And, and so a reporter like myself can see the whole process that they went through. And, and, and what their, their image advisors told them was, you need to make unlikely alliances with unlikely forces in America so that people don't see you as just being greedy corporate polluters. Um, and so they, they got much more involved at that point in criminal justice reform and reaching out to, to um, the, the NAACP and other black leaders. And, and it's created a real dilemma for a lot of sort of, you know, liberal groups who would really like the Koch's money um, because they have, between the two brothers now, are worth $90 billion. So they've got a lot to give away. And it's very hard to say no. Um, so it gets you back to that. I think it gets you back to that serpent in the <laughs> hissing. So we'll take this uh, okay. question from the woman in the second row here. And I know there's a lot more over here. We'll try and uh, get more questions in before we move to the reception. Well, speaking of the Koch brothers and people taking money from them, um, American Public Radio has had ads uh, for the Koch industries. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, personally, it, it, it makes me grate my teeth whenever I hear it, I have to say. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I've asked public radio, NPR, and, um, about it. And you know, they say they don't have a political policy about where they take money from. And they need the money. Um, so that's, I, I, just, I just think that uh, the problem is that National Public Radio is, at least in part, a news gathering organization. And it's really hard, no matter what anybody says, to bite the hand that feeds you. Um, it, 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 it inevitably is going to soften your view of them somehow. Um, and I don't have any specific evidence that they've 
you know, gone soft on the Cokes or anything like that. And I think they're very, they, they are news people of the highest integrity. But I just think it creates a problem when you're funded by people that you need to cover. How about right here in the front row? Mike? Hi. Uh, so I'm wondering, um, Coke's recently purchased Time Incorporated, and that includes Time and Sports Illustrated, a bunch of other magazines. And just where does this fit into their whole strategic plan? Is this part of getting the middle? Or what do you think about that? So I, I, I was looking at that. I wrote a quick piece about them. Um, uh, and, and I think what they really uh, were aiming for there, despite the temptation to think that, you know, to write that they're trying to take over the media and all that kind of thing is, in fact, what in that investment they made, um, they are loaning money to Meredith Corporation, the News Corporation, to buy Time Inc. And they're getting, it was 8.5% interest um, plus all kinds of other goodies that go with it. And I think it may have just been a juicy business deal for them in part. Um, they, you know, it's hard to get eight and a half percent interest these days. And, um, <laughs> and they are good, good businessmen. Um, that said, they did really try to buy the, um, what's now Tronc um, company. And they were very, they're very interested in looking at it. I, I think they'd look at, it's, it's a lot of trouble to buy a, a media operation, though. And I, I would think they'd have um, some second thoughts about it. But I, I think what they want to try to get with many of these sort of plays is credibility and acceptability. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, you, you, they want to be in the room. They want to be dealt with politely. They don't want to be laughed at. And when you own a major news organization, um, you get a certain amount of kind of credibility that goes with it. Um, how about one more from this side, and then there's someone over here, uh, right here in the second row? Thank you so much for being here today. Um, as Professor Slevin mentioned, people have been watching All the President's Men kind of as the post came out. My question goes back to trust in the media. And what struck me about the movie, watching it again, was how much it mattered to the journalists, it seemed, that the White House was denying all these articles they were printing. And I wonder now, like, if the approval of the White House is so relevant to readers. Like, if I see denial from Sarah Sanders, for instance, that may or may not have an impact on my opinion if the information is credible. As you've worked through many White Houses, you sense that your readers are, if the approval or the confirmation from the White House or from the administration in general, is that relevant to readers in determining whether or not they trust the information you give them? Well, there are denials and denials, different kinds. And in fact, even in that movie, I think they talk about non-denial denials. Um, but the sort of blanket kinds of denials that, that, that Sanders gives out from the White House or when Trump just says it's all fake news, I don't think anybody, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know, put it this way, I don't know, if, I don't know savvy journalists who worry about that. Um, it, but there is a kind of denial that reporters still do care about from the White House, a specific fact that where they, and, and, and we, it's part of the job. You call them, you check stuff with them. When they tell you it's really wrong, it didn't happen, you worry about it. And you're going to hold it or not run it till you can figure out for sure if their denial is true. I mean, I, t I still take it seriously, put it that way. Not the big, silly denials, but, but, a, but a targeted, careful denial. I mean, I wrote a piece about, about Mike Pence not long ago. And I, I ran. A, a lot of it by the White House because I really wanted to come out and be right. Um, and the job, the real job, requires talking to everybody to do that. Um, so. Right over here in the second row. Yeah. So you said it was hard to come up with a business case for buying the media. I know you wrote about the Cokes and the Federalist Society. Have they been able to invest in? all the changes in the judges that are going like mm. hot. Anyway, uh, they're going through the Senate without much resistance. Are they going to be able to take over the justice system for the next 30 or 40 years? I, I, it's, I think it's the 
the biggest concern that people should have if you're progressive, um, you know, and it's the biggest win that the conservatives potentially could get. Um, and the Kochs have put tons of effort into it. They have, if you, if you read, they, it's not just the Kochs, but a couple other very major wealthy right-wing families founded the Federalist Society and really built up a whole structure and the, around picking right-wing judges. And they've, they've, they've um, I mean, the Federalist Society really is picking the judges that that are being sent over to Trump, um, he, along with his gen, his Trump's uh, White House counsel Don McGahn has been working with them, but um, yeah, the, the the they're putting a lot of money into it. They they've uh, they put twenty million dollars in they spent in twenty sixteen um, to push. Um, favorably for Gorsuch out in ad campaigns, along with pushing for some other things. But they've been spending a lot of money in favor of these judicial choices. Um, and the ads were all over the place. I don't know if you can see them here. Um, they're planning to spend another $20 million right in this coming cycle to um, uh, push the tax plan. But I imagine they'll spend a lot on judges if, if they get, you know, if there's a fight that comes up. They're very engaged in it, very, very it's incredibly important. The Kochs are actually meeting right now um, in, in Palm Springs with their donor group. It's 550 people, it's never been bigger. 550 of the wealthiest conservatives in the country are meeting in Palm Springs with co politicians who are coming there begging for their backing. Um, and a lot of what they've been talking about is how happy they are with Trump because of Gorsuch and, and the other judicial appointments. Mm -hmm. So um, they're gunning for it, they're hoping. So we'll take two more questions and then move to the reception. The first is up here in the first row. And then thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you spoke about uh, libertarianism before and it seems pretty clear that Charles Koch has believed this from an early, I mean, he's been funding uh, libertarian causes for more than 60 years. A puzzle about Koch is the way in which basic libertarian commitments, you're not, the, the state's supposed to keep you from hurting people and nothing else is betrayed by Scott Pruitt and by the positions on global warming. Uh, it's just fundamental. So, uh, I mean, there are two different libertarian bases for resisting the state. One is that you've got this minimal state ideology and another one is that you're hurting people and you want the police to go away. And the puzzle about uh, Koch is how he seems to have moved from the first to the second, re re just inarticulately. Uh, he, doesn't, he continues to articulate the first, but this makes it very difficult to figure out. The, the man started out as an idealist, and now he's supporting this. How do well, you, what one sense of his, do you make of that? There's a, someone I quote in the book who grew up with him, um, who was a, a true believer um, with, with uh, Charles Koch in the early sort of uh, libertarian movement, and he said he thinks Charles Koch's gotten confused and now defines liberty as corporate freedom. Um, mm. And that is, I, 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 it's very hard to find anything that the Kochs support that's not good for their bottom line. I think that, and he thinks that, so I think that's sort of how he resolves it. And last question. Oh, that's kind of getting to where I was going. Um, we heard so much about how the white working class voted en masse for Trump. But I personally know a lot of, uh, the word I can think of is petite bourgeois, the small business people who are, um, what I'm, the group I'm talking about are the many, many of whom are immigrants or first or second generation immigrants. And um, could you comment on that a little bit? What, what role you think petite bourgeois small business people played in his uh, election. I, I think you're right from what I've seen of, of all the polls that, that, that you're right, people have written more about sort of the, the kind of the, um, you know, the, the, the working class element of it, but there are a lot of sort of country club uh, Republicans who are, you know, they were attracted to the to the tax policies, to the sort of imme the immediate sort of um, gains for their own uh, standing, as they saw it. I, I don't know whether, you know, how they're feeling still, but they're, you know, I mean, I think there was a certain number of 
just ordinary um, Republicans and, 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 and some ordinary Republican women too who were not working class particularly who voted, it pulled them over the top. So um, I, I, I wonder how they'll feel about the new tax um, bill because it's a new tax plan. It, it doesn't necessarily help all those people who are sort of um, upper middle class as anywhere near as much as it helps the people on the very top. I mean, 83% of the gains are going to go to the top one, per, the richest 1%, according to um, uh, Vox and other studies. So, um, I, I wonder. I wonder if they'll feel alienated at some point. But I, I don't. I haven't seen it happen yet. So, so let's get back to the best of times things. As a plan. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> where's this? What's the silver lining here? Is there a silver lining? And you because you, you can do wrap feel that journalism into, is. Yeah, if you could wrap that into a little bit of advice for the students in the school in the Medill School of Journalism, well, moving is, forward. I mean, the best of times is the. As a reporter, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but sometimes the, the worst things in the world are the best stories. Right. Um, and, and this is just the most incredible story to have this president in that, you know, in, in, in power. It, it, every, every day is a shocking story. You know, you can hardly go wrong. So, um, <laughs> as a reporter, yeah. so I, I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, you know a fascinating time, and and there's also a reaction against it all over the country that's fascinating to cover. So there, there's no just no shortage of things to write about. And then of course, I mean, really, we're talking about we've talked a lot about Trump as a personality, but his policies are having huge effects all across the country. And that's something else that I would encourage um, reporters to keep their eye on. The, the the non the less glamorous part where there's where the rubber hits the road really um, because it's going to have lasting effects so I, I you know I, I there's just no shortage of stuff to write about and some of the best reporting I've seen in a long time is being done on it true. Well, please well, join me this. this is great Janice Jessica no, probably has a final me. word yeah and Jane thank you so much That's great.